Between the release of his debut album in 1966 and his untimely death in 1975, Tim Buckley made a name for himself as one of pop music's genuine innovators. Over the course of nine albums, he incorporated the prettiest of folk music, the most extreme of freeform jazz, and the raunchiest of rock and blues. The evolution of his music, voice and songwriting can be seen in this first ever collection of TV performances, originally broadcast on British, American and Dutch television. This DVD also includes insightful interviews with Tim's longtime songwriting collaborator, Larry Beckett, David Brown, author of Dream Brother, The Lives and Music of Jeff and Tim Buckley, and Lee Underwood, Tim's frequent guitarist and author of Blue Melody. Those who have long followed Tim's music should prepare to be reintroduced to his intense and formidable stage presence. Those who never had the chance to see him on stage will now see why his legend continues to loom large over 30 years after his death. You don't serve your country, man. You serve life. You serve people. And whatever you personally can give to people. Not a country. That's secondary. There's a fellow here that had some thoughts about the country. Right. I think that uh, people ought to serve their country, not the war in Vietnam or something along those lines. And they ought to go into things like hospitals, forestry, things where this country needs them. We have hospitals all over, but they're undermanned. And we've got plenty of people oh, well, to fill them. You, got, you have a problem of business, you see. Okay, we got oil in, in, in Los Angeles spouting out of the ocean, and it's killing all sorts of sea life and everything like that. And like, but it's, it's a problem because like, we need oil. Yeah, it can, and it su supplies a lot of jobs. In uh, the ocean, you just look at it, you see. False, those are accidents that happened. They're not accidents, man. They passed bills on them, and then they, they bought off the dudes to do it over again. The oil companies. You got a problem, man. You got business cats who are taught logic and not humanity. All right. That's why right. we have ghettos. It's the ruthless economic policy in this country. True, I'll agree with that. What I'm saying... So I say, don't serve that, man. Serve people. Tim's journey from his sort of folk, kind of madrigal, Baroque folk period through his jazz period, then into his really freeform experimental period, and then into a kind of R&B kind of rock period is a really fascinating journey that's, that's kind of unlike anyone in pop music, especially because it didn't go on that long. It was only about an eight-year period in which all of this happened. He went through so many phases, and maybe at the time it seemed uh, as if he had lost his way or didn't know what he was doing. In retrospect, it has, it has a certain logic to it. We never, ever once thought of, of, uh, about commercial success. If somebody wanted to give him money to make an album of pieces we wrote, uh, fine. Uh, if not, uh, that's also fine. It, it didn't really matter. And if, if the pieces that we wrote got on the radio, that, that's fine. But if not, that was also equally fine. We were really interested in creating works uh, worthy of listening to. Most of us have a certain preference. We may like heavy metal rock. We may like classical. We may like... 50s bebop jazz, we may like punk rock, uh, we may like uh, electronic trance music, and we tend to keep our listening focused into one, maybe two boxes, and we condemn everything else. If we're a bebop jazzer, we may say, oh, I love Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie, but this Keith Jarrett guy, I, you know, he doesn't stay within the song forms and he moves out, and I don't know. Or they will say, um, I love Keith Jarrett and I love Cecil Taylor, but, uh, you know, Willie Nelson and country music, I can't handle that. And the country guy will say, I can't stand rock and roll. I love country and I you know, can't stand rock and roll. The classical guy will say, I can't stand anybody but Beethoven and Bach. Nothing after Tchaikovsky. The modern classical listener will say, well, you know, 19th century romantic music, it's all flowers and wallpaper. Who cares? Give me Schoenberg. <laughs> right? Tim understood that if you liberate your ears and open yourself to these different 
types and styles of music, you can discover yourself in new ways, which is what he was doing. I am puzzled as the oyster. Well, I think Song to the Siren is a really good example of this amazing fit that Tim and Larry Beckett had at the time. Uh, Larry would write a lyric and Tim would be off somewhere else just fiddling around with a melody and they would just kind of get together and suddenly say, oh, wait a minute, I have this melody, oh, I have these words. Actually, they kind of fit together and that happened on several occasions with those guys. And it would, I think, stun them as much as the, their, the friends around them who would be watching this happen, go like, wow, you guys are really, uh, have this connection. In songs that we collaborated on, uh, I would write lyrics at my own inspiration, hand them to him, he would come back the next day with a fully fledged piece that was in perfect harmony with what I had set out w without any, uh, there, there was some kind of uh, uncanny uh, connection between us. One day, we, I remember we arrived at a Orange County rehearsal of our Bohemians band, and I brought lyrics and he brought a melody that <laughs> worked as though they had been written together. It, it was insane. I mean, after that, we just looked at each other going, okay, well, there's something going on here, and we just need to write it. <laughs> yeah, Tim's playing gigs around town, and he's playing at the Troubadour. And, and uh, then all of a sudden, out of the blue, he's going to be on national television in a show watched by millions of people. But we didn't really think about that so much. But what does he choose to sing on this show? Does he choose uh, like one of his bad-selling singles to promote it? Or does he choose one of the songs off of his good-selling album, Goodbye and Hello, so people can recognize it? No, he chooses the newest and edgiest uh, and artiest song he has because he loves it and because he's not in the music industry. He is a troubadour. This is Tim Buckley. Long afloat on shipless ocean I did all my best to smile Till your singing eyes and fingers Drew me loving to your isle And you say, sail to me Sail to me, let me enfold you I 
puzzled as the oyster. I am troubled as the tide. Should I stand amid your breakers, or should I lie with death, my bride? Hear me sing. Swim to me, swim to me, let me fold you. Here I am, here I am, waiting to hold you. It is, in retrospect, fascinating that Tim would get such a major network platform as being as the Monkees and get a chance to play a song. And he would not play a song that was on his new album. In fact, he hadn't recorded it yet. It had just been written. And um, it's, it's very Tim in that way to kind of just defy expectations and just decide, like, no, this is the song I want to do. It's, it's not going to promote my record sales because you can't buy it on a record. And uh, I think the, the whole performance of that is just, it's pretty magical because it just seems so effortless. Mickey Dolenz introduces him. Tim just kind of ambles out. He sits down on this beat up, guitar, uh, beat up car. It's like on the set. Um, he, Tim doesn't say anything to the audience. He just kind of goes into this song. He's in full on Tim sort of Roman god flower child mode. He's got this hair is wild. He's got the, uh, the, the blue denim shirt that he used to wear all the time. Um, he's got his head cocked to the side. He's singing very tenderly. You know, that's the Tim that most people first heard and many young women fell in love with. And to this day, a lot of people think that's the prime Tim era uh, that, that encapsulated. Tim and I, uh, independently, at the end of his life, uh, he uh, just before the end, we were planning a two uh, album best of, but it was not going to be like anybody's best of since he'd had no hits. How can you have a best of? But we were going to do, he was going to do the best songs that, that he and I had written, and uh, that was our first choice. We both thought, independently came up with that as the s single best song we'd written. And, the, the, and I think the fact that it's been covered so many times and will go on being covered is that it's a perfect match of, of uh, melody and lyric and a, and a powerful statement. But no man can find the war. This performance of No Man Can Find the War is from a 1967 CBS special called Inside Pop, The Rock Revolution. If a TV network were to do a show like that today, you wouldn't think twice. Back then, 1967, it was extremely rare, and it was also extremely rare to see someone like Leonard Bernstein hosting it and talking about how important this new rock and roll music was. And Bernstein was basically saying, I take this music seriously, and you should too. I was presenting Tim to the world as a, a, a sort of new Bob Dylan and new big shining light in the pop world, and that was a, that was a real uh, coup. What I want to know is why you went to war in the first place. That's the question. That's the, the question we need an answer to. We need to stop going to war. Waters fly like bullets stream. Drums and cannons laugh aloud. Whistles come from ashen shrouds. Leaders down the world and roar. But no man can find the war. Most of us have been raised in the tradition of Tin Pan Alley, where the songs, beautiful or not, were meant to amuse or beguile, but that's all. They were embellishments on life. 
what these young people seem to say is that their music isn't just decorative. Is the war inside your mind? And poets wail All the world knows the score But no man can find the war And that's the pop music scene today. Serious and silly, sweet and grandiose, but all coming out of the kids themselves. They are trying hard, but whatever young people do, they tend to overdo. The jury is still out on their social ideas, but the verdict on their music is in. A great deal of it is good. I waited in my fleeting house. His instrument was the guitar, and from very early on, you could see him uh, trying to get outside. I mean, he, after he had learned the set standard chords, you could see him trying to get outside that. What can I do? What can I do with my fingers to make something new? Tim said he had, had injured his finger so that he couldn't bar a chord. On a guitar you're playing, you have to be able to bar the chord here across the board, and then you play other notes with these fingers here. He said he couldn't bar a chord. I did see a picture where he was barring a chord, but he was also playing a, a nylon string guitar, uh, where, where the string, it's easier to push the strings down with a nylon string. So yeah, he s said he, he had that injury, and it was difficult, if not impossible, for him to bar a chord. So he really did wonderful things by inventing different kinds of chords that he could play with, with his index finger without having to bar a chord, and did a really great job of it. Matter of fact, nobody's really touched upon what a good 12-string guitar player he was. He developed his own style, played his tush off with the strumming, uh, and, and devised all sorts of chordal uh, combinations uh, that were very interesting and very original. Made a real nice contribution at that level, as well as singing and writing songs. I lit my purest candle Close to my window, hoping it would catch the eye of any vagabond who passed it by. And I waited in my fleeting house. Before he came, I felt the ancient fear and as he neared I felt him drawing near that he had come to wound my door and jeer but I waited in my fleeting house oh tell me stories I call Stories of old I smiled at the hobo Stories of cold I wept to the hobo And I waited in my fleeting house 
Go said the hobo, no more tales of time. Don't ask me now to wash away the grime. I can't come in for it's too high a climb. And it stood before my fleeting house. Then you be damned, I screamed to the hobo. Turn into stone, I wept to the hobo. Leave me alone, I knelt to Walked away from my fleeting house. I have been invited to direct various Broadway shows, uh, but I've never had the time to do it. Uh, give it a try. Give it a oh, try. I'd love it. I'd love it. Uh, right. Jane and I are toying with the idea. Hey, here it is, huh? <laughs> Darling, I saw Tim earlier, and my hairdresser is in Reno on vacation, and I'm panicky because I have nobody to do my hair, and I saw yours, and I thought, got to get him. Who does your hair? <laughs> Uh, nobody. It just grows like that. Really? Yeah. Just let it grow and live with it, and that's, that's it. That's groovy. Yeah, I dig that. Thank you. <laughs> Tim, did you write that song you sang? Uh, yeah. I'm sorry I didn't come out. I was. I didn't know what I was supposed to do. That's all right. I don't know what I'm supposed to do either. Yeah, it's it like that. I just come here and, you know, wail for 90 minutes a night, and it works out. Uh, do you write all of your music, or most of it? Yeah. Yes, I do. That's great. In a sense, that's, it's a good thing for the music business because nobody can sing a song and give it the true meaning in a way, like the guy who wrote it. There are some exceptions oh, to that. Oh, you can. You do great. You write great songs. Well, but that's, that's what well, I mean. When I sing true. my own songs... Oh, yeah, I've heard you. I have so often seen singers that I say to Steve, oh, so, you know, she's on key, or technically she's a good singer, but nothing hits you. Mm -hmm. No emotion. No emotion. No, mm -hmm. The words, or whatever you're trying to sell, doesn't come across. Now, isn't that why you, a lot of you young people, are doing your own songs? Because you want to get a message across? Message? I don't know. I think it's just to have a good time. Is it? Really. Oh, if we, wonderful. We have to pause for a moment for a commercial. We'll be right back. Starting around 1968, Tim started writing more of his own lyrics. Uh, in part, it was just his own interest in expressing himself. In part, it was the reality that Larry Beckett had been drafted and wasn't going to be around. And I think you see that on the uh, Happy Sad album. Those, most of those lyrics are written by Tim himself. And Happy Time is a good example of that, in that it's, um, it's Tim trying to kind of express himself and what was going on in his head. There's an interesting line in there just about the way they use your name. It seems to be the first sign that Tim was getting very um, wary of the music business and what people were forcing him to do, like, say, being on the Steve Allen show. And so I think that song and that album was really the first look we had into what was going on in Tim's brain. And even though the music was starting to get a little bit lighter, it wasn't as heavier and produced and baroque as Happy Sad, it was a little more groove-oriented, a little jazzier, kind of wafted a, a little bit more. But, you know, the, the lyrics were more personal and, and getting a little bit darker as they went along. So it's an interesting kind of yin-yang thing going on in those records. Inside my mind, when a melody does find a rhyme and 
says to me, I'm coming home to stay. Just such a colossal explosion of music in the rebirth of rock and roll in 64, 65, that um, there's almost too many models to point to in it. I don't think it really had so much to do with people that we met as with what was pouring out. You didn't even have to have a radio, you know, you'd be <laughs> walking, we'd be walking down the streets to get a pizza in Greenwich Village and you know, set me free, why don't you, baby, by a vanilla fudge would be pouring out of somebody's window and we'd just go, good God, it's good to be alive, you know. We're in a concert of our music. If you talk to anyone in Tim's circle, one of the things you will always hear is how many girls there were who were around. He had a lot of uh, female fans back then, and he also had a lot of uh, female friends of his who would just... Uh, kind of develop his crushes on him, and Tim would sort of encourage that. He would sort of nuzzle with them. And he was, he was, he was kind of a very sexual guy, which is something that you don't always grasp from hearing his records. Um, and I think you see that in the Who Do You Love clip. You see that sort of um, really kind of churning sexuality in his performance. You know, he's not just sitting there with his guitar like he does sometimes. He's really kind of moving with the rhythm, and there's something very, uh, very carnal and very sensual about that performance. And it's 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 worth being reminded that he wasn't always uh, seen by his fans and female fans in particular as just this, you know, cute little bushy-haired, sensitive guy sitting in a chair with his guitar. That there was this other attraction to him, which Tim encouraged both in his personal behavior and sometimes on stage. He, um, he really had a real magnetic, a real, a real charisma to him, a real magnetic attraction to him. Uh, the kind of guy who, you know, women would sort of want to sleep with and men would want to kind of be buddies with. And he, and he had that real kind of power and he used it when he could. 
every performance he gave his all. I would never, I stood on stage with him for seven of those nine years and played with him uh, for seven of the nine albums. Uh, and I never saw him give a slipshod, lackadaisical, sleepwalk performance. I mean, you take uh, so many individual stars and groups, they're just recycling their hits. They can sleepwalk through any of that stuff. Chuck Berry doing his little goose walk, whatever you call it, across the stage. I mean, you know, it's great. It's entertaining. It's what the people want, right? And all these other groups that come and, and duplicate the records. Tim never did that. Tim always gave you his immediate... He always gave you the present, the living present. He flamed. It's not an inappropriate image. That is one of the most perfect images. He stood in the middle of the flames and sang his heart out. All right, he gave it all.
So let me sing a song for you. When people think of Tim Buckley and his band, they usually think of a certain core lineup, and that's usually Lee Underwood on guitar and Carter Collins on congas, and there were one or two different bass players and maybe a different vibes player who would also augment this, this trio over time. But that's sort of the core group uh, of Tim's, one of Tim's most fertile periods. And it was a, a really interesting sound for Tim because on one hand, you know, um, Lee Underwood's guitar, very kind of jazz influenced, very kind of... Uh, dashing and darting around the melodies and sort of, you know, augmenting the melodies. And Carter doing um, very kind of Afro-Cuban kind of percussion work. It's, it's styles you wouldn't necessarily think would jive. And on top of it, Tim playing a 12-string guitar, which is very much a sort of American folk rock instrument. So you had three very different approaches to music making right in that trio. And yet it all kind of came together really beautifully. Tim had the big 12 string, so he had the, the chords and the, you know, the bottom part of the, the register. Uh, and then his mid voice played mid range and, and melodies. And then I played melodies sort of over and through his voice, kind of counter melodies. So we had a kind of a dance and a flow together. Uh, I also did not keep strict time, you know, foot tappy times within the bar lines. I would kind of float over the tops of the bar lines, even as I do in my own playing to this day. I've gone to develop that on the piano a lot, move well out of the uh, orthodox time framework, no metronome stuff. Uh, it's more of a flow like water or wind across the grass. And when they added on a bass player and a vice player later on for some later recordings they made, uh, I think it was definitely one of Tim's best bands, if not the best band he ever had. It was the most sympathetic, I think, to his melodies. In my heart Is where I long for you In my smile I search for you each time you turn and run away, I cry and sign My silly way, just too young to know anymore In my world, the devil dances and dares to leave my soul just anywhere until I find Peace in this world I'll sing a song Everywhere I can Just too young to know anymore The wind covers me cold Starry skies all around my eyes Far behind the city moans Well worthy of the people there Oh, the songs they'd love to hear So let me sing a song for you Just to help your day along Let me sing a song for you When I've known so very long Oh, please could you Find the time. It begins and ends with his voice. The, the thing is that you are at a disadvantage because you haven't 
sat in the same room and listened to him sing. You know, we would just be sitting around and he, he, he'd, you know, sing some old folk, folk song like Geordie. And everything would have to cease to, to listen to this miracle, this extraordinary Irish tenor voice just completely nailing this song. Uh, and he's like 18 years old. My God, where is this all coming from? I don't know. But it was like sitting around with Caruso. It's like all business must stop and be postponed until this guy finishes with this aria. You know? So, and it, it didn't matter any point in his life. Uh, he, he just got better and better at singing, expanding the boundaries of what it even means to sing. It's a happy time inside my mind when a melody does find a rhyme and says to me... A musician who deserves more recognition in the Tim Buckley context uh, is conga player Carter Collins, uh, a black man who played congas but was also did it very musically. He wasn't just a flashy rhythm guy, although he could do that. He also played those little ting bells. Um, he could make sounds on the conga, he put his elbow on, and he worked with the sonic qualities as well as the rhythmic qualities of the congas. Carter was just uh, his fantastic conga player, which was, added a real sensual uh, uh, kind of non-standard rhythm. It's rhythm, but it's not a drum kit, you know what I'm saying? And, and that, that just worked for so many years in so many contexts. Well, this was shocking to a lot of people. Have a black man on stage with a white group, right? This was not, uh, this was not an accept... It's not that it wasn't accepted, it just wasn't... Uh, it was kind of new. Right? Tim was breaking grounds this way. He liked Carter personally, and Tim was also a rebel and a warrior. Right? And he knew this whole black subjugation by white racists was the wrong thing. See? So he was very much on the side of Carter and the whole movement toward black power, black equality, black respect. Let the wind blow through your head Let the morning sun warm 
Now, the, the problem is, of course, is that we've been decadent so, for so long that uh, we don't realize how much power that a collective body of Christians have. Billy Graham goes to Anaheim, and there's uh, 10,000 people there every night for a whole week. Uh, and every third word is Jesus, <laughs> or him, you dig. And he's getting bread. OK, now there's power there, because there's need to be come together in a, in a safe situation. Those 10,000 Christians that listen to Billy Graham are getting a sense of security, they are getting a sense of praise, and they uh, if, have no reason uh, to advocate change and have good reason to militate, uh, uh, to resist change. Uh, they, uh, and I would not count on them. What do you count on? Well, I don't know who I count on. Uh, uh, to me, the majority, I'm, as I get older and older, I uh, like to think I'm getting more and more perspective, and I'm remembering a phrase that I think Alex Ham Hamilton used in uh, one of the federal papers, Federalist Papers of Jefferson, when he says, either he said or Samuel Johnson, and <laughs> they never even knew each other, the people is a monster. I woke up. Our working relationship did change as he, for whatever reasons you want to speculate, decided after Goodbye and Hello to go his own way lyrically for a while. But then after, it only took about two years of that experiment, uh, for better or worse, and then he approached me to start writing together again. And at first that was a little rocky as we tried to collaborate on I Woke Up, collaborate on the lyrics together, and quickly decided that that was not pleasant at all. And then what happened was that I would send him work like before, even though we were in different states. I was in Oregon, he was in California now. I would send him work and then he would say something like, can I have two more verses? That so I would send down two more verses. Or he, I would send him three songs and he would take two verses from one song, the bridge from another and the last verse from another song and collage it together into something of his own devising. <laughs> and uh, I, that's all right by me. Larry had no idea what the music would be like from what he says, that he just, you know, they, Tim picked these lyrics, and Tim made some comments to Larry about different time signatures and different tonalities he wanted to try, but Larry didn't have any idea what that was until he actually went down to Los Angeles and popped into the studio when they were making Star Sailor and suddenly heard what was going on and was as surprised as everyone else, although um, happy to hear it at the same time. He was very intensely exploring different ways of creating within song structures new concepts, new rhythms, new harmonies, new ways of singing, new contexts in which he could improvise. So yes, as a composer, he grew, he developed, he explored, he did all kinds of wonderful things uh, that other songwriters that I know of offhand didn't do. So this is part of his uniqueness, part of the excitement about discovering Tim Buckley is moving into uh, his conceptual evolutionary development from stage to stage to stage. I don't think for either one of us there was a, a, in this context of songwriting, there was a stronger influence than the, than the example of Miles Davis. Miles Davis was a man who, who uh, changed every time he turned around. He would completely reinvent what music is. He would go back and say, now everything that I've learned, he once said, uh, uh, you know why I don't play those ballads? You know, he played those ballads so beautifully that it would make you cry. And one day he said, I'm not gonna play them ever again. And they said, why? And he said, because I love them too much. He, didn't, he knew that it, it, the minute you are seduced into the easy path of art, then you just lose it. You have to be out on the edge. He always was. And he took no shit off anybody. If they didn't want to release his music, I mean, he, he played this classical piece uh, uh, and, and they said, we have to release it under Miles Davis. And he said, no, it's written by a composer. 
You have to release it under his name. They said, no, we're going to put it out under Miles Davis. He said, okay, I quit. And that's how he left Columbia Records. They let Miles Davis go.
the sound of the town was calling you far from my dream far from where I was born to give secretly The times would change your ways, your world, and the tides of time will change for you. As we went out on the road night after night playing music with Tim uh, and following this improvisational process, it was at once a great inspiration because you, things were new every night. Also, you didn't have to worry about making a mistake and not playing a preconceived part the way it should be played. You didn't have to worry about that element of it. It was not a technical exercise that we were into. It was a matter of feeling the music and finding the flow, attuning yourself with the music. Even as Tim was attuning himself with the music within him, we were attuning ourselves to the music that was coming out. That album, Star Sailor, was the peak of Tim's artistic development. He took it, he called it his masterpiece. He told me uh, later down the line, he said, my masterpiece was Star Sailor. Well, needless to say, it was so far out that uh, it was rejected by most of the critics and nearly all of the people. I should add that not all of the critics panned that album. Uh, Michael Bourne of Downbeat gave it five stars in a rave review. Lester Bangs of Cream Magazine uh, dropped his usually scathing, put down his sort of scathing, mean-spirited style and saying Tim Buckley's praises to the skies for Star Sailor as, as one of the great innovators in pop music and a refreshing voice, an amazing voice, a musician who had not only a voice but knew how to use it in musical ways as an instrument in its own right. By the time Happy Sad came out, he was already into Lorca and Star Sailor, see? So you can't go back and play Happy Sad songs there because that's betraying yourself as an artist. And it's also betraying your mission as an artist, which is to help people dive deeper into themselves and fly higher and come to know themselves in new ways. Adventurous listeners welcome that. It wasn't jazz, it wasn't rock, it wasn't contemporary classical, it wasn't sort of operatic. It, it was almost a little bit of all of that together, often within the same songs. And it's, um, it, it's, it's mind-boggling to think what people thought of it in 1970. You listen to it now, 35 or so years later, and it still sounds not only pretty fresh, but just completely in its own universe. Today, I get more letters from people praising Star Sailor than I do from people who are still talking about Goodbye and Low and Happy Sad. Tim's mother was a Miles Davis fan, and Tim grew up hearing that music, and as a kid used to bicycle around town uh, imitating horn instruments on his voice, and that was the first time that he sensed that potential in himself. Uh, and, but it didn't really reach its potential until the Star Sailor period, and you hear it on something like Come Here Woman, where his voice goes up and down like a trombone, and the, the instruments around him are almost imitating him. It's really fascinating that there, the, the, whether it's uh, the trumpet or whether it's the guitars, 
and, and John Balkan's bass. Uh, not afraid to kind of slide up and down, sound like beached whales, sound like whatever kind of um, crazy sound you could make. And not, not, you know, Tim did not want his voice to sound like a traditional voice, and he encouraged his musicians to not get typical traditional sounds out of their instruments as well.
Anyone who interviewed Jeff Buckley when he was alive would hear from Jeff that he didn't know Tim's music that well, that Tim wasn't there when he grew up. He really kind of distanced himself from Tim in every kind of way. He would say, oh, I was into Led Zeppelin and the Smiths more than my father. But he really loved and admired the Lorca and Star Sailor period. He thought that was Tim's greatest moment. Uh, he loved the way that Tim was um, pushing against any kind of conventions and the way Tim was pushing the envelope on all these forms and, and uh, sort of tapping into this transcendent plane and, and all that, all those things that appealed to Jeff as a musician as well. And they both shared that sensibility and ironically, even though Tim was never around to impart any of this to Jeff, it was all just learned through recordings and through whatever Jeff read, but they shared that sensibility of of not wanting to make it easy for themselves or their audience, and they share that sensibility of, of stretching their voices as much as they could, um, almost not even finding a middle ground, like they would, the voice would go from kind of a low to a high real fast and then back down again, never kind of settling, you know, in certain points and in, into a certain um, kind of timber. And, you know, so when you're watching Come Your Woman, it's hard not to think of the influence that uh, Tim had on Jeff from afar. Jeff was very wise to have as his mentor his father. Jeff listened to all of Tim's records, especially Lorca and Star Sailor, and incorporated dozens of techniques uh, of Tim's into his own magnificent arsenal of individual uh, approaches. Now, as I say, I think Tim's the only guy I know of who, I mean, Jeff is the only guy I know of who was capable of doing that. I've heard other people who had nice high tenor voices, uh, and I'm sure that there are people out there, especially today, who have been influenced by both Tim and Jeff. But as far as I know, Jeff is the only one who was able to do it. And I really, I, again, I have to tip my hat to him for his intelligence, for his passion, for his abilities, because uh, he really uh, came through in brilliant, impassioned fashion, and of course proved to be commercially more viable than Tim ever was. When I was born, the blue melody. You know, Tim's uh, uh, childhood and teen years were not particularly pleasant, and you know, he he. He never really wrote about it in any kind of straightforward way, for whatever reason. Maybe it was too personal. Uh, Blue Melody is is the first uh, uh, one of the first songs in which you get some hint of what was what seemed so sad in a way about Tim. Just a little song, my mom. 
almost sang to me It was so He was saying, I love my music so much that I'll do whatever it takes to pull it up and out of me and give it to you. And if I have to die young, if I have to burn so hard at both ends until I flame out in the middle, so be it. This is my, this is my life. I was born a blue melody. And I sing that blue melody all the way through my life. Sing the music boats Bidding the bay 
Venice, uh, astonishingly, is just a portrait of our lives down there in Venice in those years. Uh, but in, in the in the late '60s, I can testify that every single detail in the song is drawn from real life, <laughs> just put into verse. So. Uh, it, it had not been scheduled for uh, any album session, and at that point, I think we were not really back. We were apart as songwriters, so to see it appear on Boba Kavara, I knew that he had written music to it, but to see it appear, that was magical, uh, in, in, in a, a beautiful performance. It, it tries to evoke those days, and I think succeeds. The Bobo Cavare video is one of the few videos uh, that we have where you can see the principle uh, of improvisation and structure in action. Some of the songs, like Blue Melody, uh, was a, pretty much a song form. He sang the song, we improvised around it. And that Bobo Kavari thing shows it pretty well, how we just move the flow, go from here to here to here with Tim giving little signals, and then all of us improvising in the middle of it. None of us had parts. Buzz Gardner didn't have a part, right? The drummer didn't have a part, the bass player, I didn't have a part. Nobody had parts. Even Tim didn't have a part. He was just kind of the leader of the band. And the music flowed through him, he followed it, and we followed him. Wide heat of swing day. Dark slap of conga cries Come out and breathe as one Salt sea and fiddles drawn Out on the dancing stone While the Santana's blow Sing Two for the tug of war, 
three for the shining girl, four for the hands of man, five for the loves that stands, six for our rolling bones, and the music bones in the bay. Starting with the Lorca album, which was in 1969, Tim decided it was time to basically invent a new kind of music. Uh, he told an interviewer back then, and I'm paraphrasing, well, you know, we've sort of figured out what we're doing now, and we want to now just cr create a whole new way of writing songs and performing them, which, you know, sounds in impossibly pretentious, you know, now. But when you see these performances from Boba Kavari, which was a, a public television show in Los Angeles, and you, if you hear the Star Sailor album as well, you, you realize Tim was totally right. Whatever money Tim was making from his music, which wasn't much to begin with, was pretty much drying up by 1971. The club gigs were getting few and far between because the music was just getting too out there and it was turning off audiences and uh, club promoters. And Star Sailor bombed in the record store. So Tim basically had to look for other ways to make a living and support his new family. He had just married to Judy and they had just uh, adopted his... Uh, uh, her son Taylor from her first marriage. And so Tim basically took whatever he could get. He started exploring the idea of actually acting. He took a role in a movie called Why, in which he co-starred uh, with, of all people, O.J. Simpson. This was a sort of free-form um, film uh, about a group therapy session in which Tim played a musician. He appeared in this movie, Christian Licorice Store, singing Pleasant Street. Uh, he, he wrote a script with his friend Dan Gordon for a movie called Fully Air Conditioned Inside, which was a really dark, humored uh, tale of uh, the show business and the record industry and that exposed all of Tim's uh, fears and concerns about the business and, and being sort of ruined by it. So there was a lot going on then uh, that Tim basically would then ignore once he got back into the music world. And, but what we're left with are a few relics from that period, and one of which is this clip from uh, Christian Liquor Store with him doing an, a very rare filmed solo unplugged performance of Pleasant Street. I think it's wonderful that new people are discovering Tim uh, today. Uh, one of the reasons they can enjoy it is because so much of his music is timeless. Uh, you listen to a song like Pleasant Street, or you listen to some of the uh, Greetings from L.A. songs, or Strange Feeling from Happy Sad, uh, or Who Could Deny You, or Look at the Fool from some of the uh, later albums. And there's a timelessness about him. They don't date very much, uh, if at all. The style is still present. His singing is timeless. Uh, people can really they plug into this Tim Buckley guy and they're going to discover a wonderful, wonderful singer. Where to go 
You don't remember what to choose Censorship is a drag. I think that pornography and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and 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 dope ought to be uh, made um, not legalized, but uh, put into hospital type of things. I mean, we're into different things now. You got people strung out on dope, and you have uh, people in criminally insane. We're, you know, there's more to it than just ghettos, and your black problem and my white problem and things like that. We got things that are happening, man. That like are are actually putting us in a state of mind of accepting things. Like TV from the very beginning and also public schools have been, has been the great lobotomizer all, all along. I mean, you sit and watch a TV and it's uh, hypnosis. It, it works on, uh, on uh, some sort of uh, eye strain and all sorts of multi-images and everything like that. And you sit there and look at it, it doesn't matter what, what you're looking at, it's just hypnotizing you. And it isn't, it, it's, you, it's just a big thing. Anything that, that can be put in a lot of people's homes is made for bread. Now, you got people who are hip enough inside in the inner world knowing that everything in the outer world is not the world. Cars, your suit, how much perfume you wear, it, that's not the world. What's the world is what's inside and what cats have lived to pull out of themselves all through time. Tim Buckley, thank you for, for being here. Good luck on your tour and make it back to Venice, California in good health. When Tim decided to kind of re-enter the music business in 1972, uh, he basically decided, probably with the advice of his manager and, and label, who were one and the same at that point, to, you know, try to have a hit record. You know, he did have a family to support now and you know, only had a few thousand dollars in the bank at that point, so it was time to get a little more serious. And so he put together a rock band, recorded uh, an album called Greetings from L.A., and then one called Sophronia after that, and uh, from which the song we're about to see, Sally Go Round the Roses, is taken. And, you know, it was typically Tim, in that on one hand, the music was perhaps a little more radio-friendly, it was a little more rock, uh, he was using all those, um, you know, the kind of traditional instrumental lineup that he had always avoided, you know, electric lead guitar and electric bass and drums and a keyboard, very much a kind of a rock band uh, setup. And, you know, but Tim, of course, would never go the easy route in no matter what he did. So he uh, basically decided to kind of not sing traditional rock lyrics with that. He decided to spice it up a little bit. And what you got were some pretty sexual, at times graphic lyrics, uh, both on Greetings from L.A. and, and on Sally Go Round the Roses, uh, 
with images of, uh, you know, there was, uh, there was whips and chains, and there were kind of lesbian images, and there were all kinds of things going on in the radio, which of course completely prevented any of these somewhat commercial songs from getting on the radio. And it was sort of Tim sabotaging himself in a, in a, in a way, but at the same way being true to himself, because Tim never totally wanted to conform to whatever expectations were presented uh, of him, and he always wanted to take his own route. And you even see that in a clip like this, where he's uh, introducing it with some riffing on drug use and, um, and doing a kind of lighthearted song, but giving it a real Tim Buckley twist, not being content to just go the route that uh, anyone else would have taken to get back on the charts. Uh, so he moved into Greetings from L.A., Sophronia, and Look at the Fool, Lo and behold, the same thing happened that happened with Star Sailor. The people who like Tim's earlier thing, say goodbye and low and happy sad, were most dismayed when Tim went to Lorca and Star Sailor. Said, oh, what are you doing? You're crazy. And they denounced him. So Tim built a new audience, people who liked really extremely sophisticated music. Then when Tim went from Star Sailor to the funk and rock and roll period, all the Star Sailor people said, you're a sellout, right? Including some of his so-called best friends, right? So Tim couldn't win either way, right? He kept going. He kept on keeping on, which I admire him for to no end. And in this latter period of those three albums, he really, I call it mergence music in my book, Blue Melody, Tim Buckley Remembered. I call it mergence music. I don't think he was a sellout at all. Sure, he needed money, but he also needed to go someplace conceptually beyond uh, Star Sailor. Where could he go? He went into funk, funk rock. It was great. Judy liked it. Uh, Tim had a whole new source of music to explore and develop and did it truly well. This tune is a real old one. It goes back. It goes back when you sniff an evil night train. It climbing all over that girl in the back seat of your car. You had one foot in the glove compartment. And the other one changing the changing the stations on the radio. Well, we used to be down on the street harmonizing like this.
Like a lot of young singer-songwriters in the mid-60s, Tim was a huge fan of Fred Neal, who was an iconic Greenwich Village folk blues singer-songwriter who was known for songs like Everybody's Talking, The Other Side of His Life, and The Dolphins. Uh, Tim really looked up to and admired Neal uh, for his singing and his guitar playing and his the kind of mystique he had around him. Tim was absolutely and appropriately bedazzled by uh, Fred's marvelous singing, the passion, uh, the willingness to vary a song even as he did different takes of it. He phrased things differently. Fred would get into improvisation and of course Fred Neal's fantastic voice so between the voice, the passion, the great songs, the willingness to stretch out, uh, Tim realized, oh my goodness, there's a whole lot going on here. And The Dolphins is a song that really struck a chord with Tim. He was doing it live as early as 67 or 68. And in fact, uh, there's a line in Once I Was, Tim's own song, that sort of kind of either rips off or pays homage to, to uh to Fred Neal's The Dolphins, uh, the uh, sometimes I wonder if you ever think of me is almost an exact copy of uh, of a line in uh, in the Fred Neal song. Influence is something that everybody has to work through if they're really going to go somewhere. Take something they love and then mimic it perfectly, and then eventually find their own voice, of which that it will be one thread. When he was making the Y movie in 1971, Tim was talking to one of his uh, co-stars. And he started talking all about this song and about how it's about a guy who has a, a child who he never sees. And he, he, he described this whole song that basically sounded like his life. And the, uh, the woman, whose name was Linda Gillen, was fascinated by this. She hadn't heard this song before. So she went out and got the, uh, probably the Fred Neal version of the song and listened to it. And she didn't hear any of that stuff in it. There was nothing specific about a child and, and you know, but, but I think that's revealing that Tim read a lot into that song. It wasn't just uh, his, his, um, his, his uh, worshiping of Fred Neal that intrigued him. It was that song really spoke to him in some really, in some really deep way. And it seems it's such a melancholic song and it maybe taps a little bit into uh, Tim's, you know, kind of Irish melancholy as well, his family background, the guilt that he had over leaving Jeff before Jeff was even born, which did linger with him and he, throughout his life. He didn't talk about it that much, but uh, it was there, and he, he did feel bad about that a lot of times. And so there were a lot of issues that Tim was grappling with uh, right up until his death. and. I think the Dolphins was a way of him to kind of express that, even if he wasn't quite able to do that himself in his own songs or verbally. Saturday's child And all about the time When we were running wild I've been a searching Tell. 
For this old world how to get along I only know that peace will come When all I hate is gone I've been a-searching For the dolphin in the sea To paraphrase Charles Dickens, it was 1974 was the best and the worst of times for Tim Buckley. And on the one hand, he put out a record called Look at the Fool, which was yet another kind of commercially compromised record that didn't do well and didn't restore his status in terms of the music business and the charts. Uh, and I think that was all very disillusioning to him. On the other hand, he decided to basically start from scratch. He broke with his manager and reunited with Larry Beckett, started talking about maybe recording a live album of some of their best-known early songs. Uh, he started writing new songs and doing more shows with his band. Um, he talked about maybe trying to get back into acting. Uh, he reconvened with Larry also to talk about r recording a concept album based on Joseph Conrad's Outcast of the Islands, and Larry Beckett had already written the lyrics for it, and they had it all kind of sketched out in their heads. So even though it was, the year represented a real low point in some ways, on the other hand, it was the beginning of what could have been a new phase for Tim. Tim was a musician, an artist. To make a statement, that's what he was doing. He wasn't there to flatter. He was there to make a statement. That's hard to do. It's hard to have the stuff to do it. And then when you do it and you don't always get accepted, it's even harder still because they all want you to turn around and, and be like a television set, just mirroring the the vulgarities and the social values and the conditioning. Tim was trying to cut through all of that. He was a revolutionary, an evolutionary, uh, a kind of incipient mystic. He was my best friend uh, the day he died, and we had been having long, long phone conversations where I might even fall asleep and then wake up, he'd still be talking, um, sharing everything. Uh, when I was awake. Ever since then, I have dreams like everybody else. So they're all confused, you know, you're in a stadium, you have some of your clothes on, uh, a big poetry reading's coming up, I don't know, you know, that kind of thing. And then I would, I, 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 they started being salted in with dreams in which he would appear. These dreams were completely different from my ordinary dreams or ordinary dreams in that there was no surrealism at all. We'd be in a room, not one I recognized, but one with furniture that stayed where it was, or no unusual events, like we're in some place in the world. And he was there, and he, he would just be talking to me as if nothing had happened, and say, I'd say, well, Tim, uh, it was great to see you, and um, so what are you up to? He'd say, well, I'm working on a new album, I've got all this stuff, needs some lyrics though, of course. And I'd say, a new album, you're dead. You can't put out more albums. But you see, actually, I was wrong. He, he comes out with new albums all the time. <laughs> I've, I've gone on having those dreams to this day. So what is that, 30 years? I had one the other day. I don't know what they mean, but... Uh, uh, would be really great to find out. Just like a buzzing fly came into your life And I float away like honey in the sun And was it right or wrong I couldn't sing that song Well, that's 
way of life. For me, anyway, and for most musicians who play guitar. Or any musician who plays any sort of instrument, actually. After any, any length of time, if they really get into what they're doing, it becomes, you know, a way of life, another way of expressing yourself, just like talking.